morning, everybody. Here to worship God today. We've waited for this day. We've gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like the fire, awakening desire, will burn our hearts with you. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens. We want to see you open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Your presence in this place, your glory on our face, we're looking to the sky. Descending like a cloud, you're standing with us now. Lord, unveil our eyes. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens. We want to see you open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart. Filling every part of our praise. Oh, sing it again. Sing open up the heavens. We want to see you open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart. Feeling every part of our praise. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Oh, Lord. oh show us, show us, show us your glory. Show us. Show us your power, show us, show us your glory, Lord. Oh, Lord. Sing it one more time. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Show us, show us your power, show us, show us your glory, Lord. Oh, and open up the heavens. We want. A mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our brain. Oh, and open up the heavens. We want to see you open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our brain. Amen. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Open up the floodgates. A mighty river. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. You may be seated. Yes, you may be seated. Hallelujah. Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for your presence that we sense in our midst. Lord, we sensed it early this morning. Lord, uh, in our Bible study, oh, Lord God, and here in, in your house and in this sanctuary, Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you're here with us, oh, God. And, Lord, our expectation is in you today. Lord, and we just want to give you praise and glory. We want to pray, Lord God, uh, this year, many of the churches, this one is uh, a dear friend of mine, Pastor Cecilio Hernandez, Ebenezer Church in Lowell, uh, just a terrific man and a man of God. And just want to pray for him and, and his dear wife and, and, and the, the family that's there uh, that he's uh, teaching and preaching. Father, we just come before you. We ask, oh God, we lift up uh, Lord Cecilio, Lord, and uh, Lord, just uh, I, I pray, oh God, a, a, a double portion of anointing to, would be upon him as he teaches and preaches, Lord, and counsels uh, his parishioners there. Lord, I just ask, oh God, that to give him a great harvest of souls. Lord, just bless him real good, oh Lord God, and we'll be just very careful to praise you and give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's continue to worship the Lord, but let's say hello to each other. Amen. Turn around. Why don't you stand, everybody, and just greet yeah. someone. Say, say hi, wave, say hello. I know we're separated a little bit by the social distancing, but uh, we can uh, still be social. Amen. And uh, uh, look, we're glad that you're here today. We're going to worship God. 
today, and I just wanted, you know, past, I was just thinking as Pastor Dick was uh, uh, praying, uh, anointing upon my friend Pastor Cecilio, do you know the anointing is not just for pastors? No, that's the right. anointing is for you as well. Anointing yeah. means you've been chosen. You've been empowered by God, and one of the things you've been empowered to do is to lift him up in praise. So let's do that today. Oh, who am I that you are mindful of me? That you hear me when I call. Come on, let me hear you. Is it true that you are thinking of me? That you love me? It's amazing. Come on, sing it again. Who am I? Who am I that you are mindful of me? Oh, Lord, that you hear me. When I call, is it true that you are thinking of me? How you love me, it's amazing that I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. God. Oh, I am a friend of God. Oh, I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. Well, who am I that you are mindful of me? That you hear me when I call. Oh, Lord, we call to you today. Is it true that you are thinking of me? How you love me. I said it's amazing. Oh, yes, it's amazing. Oh, that I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. Oh, and I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. Oh, and I am a friend of God. Oh, he is God Almighty, Lord of glory. You, you have called me friend. Oh, is God Almighty, Lord of glory. You have called me friend. See it again, he's God.
and on to the land to him who sits on the throne and on to the land be blessing and honor and glory and power
presence of God is here this morning. And if you want to praise him, if you want to lift him up, you need to open up your heart. And not just sing the words of a song, but give a message to Jesus with your heart. Let the words of the song be your message of praise.
cry holy 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 we cry holy 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 yes we cry Jesus, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. I sense his presence in this place. Amen. There's a sweet, sweet presence. God is here. So thankful that we can come to him at any time. And right now we want to pray for those who need prayer, need a healing touch. Whatever the need is, we say this so often because it's true. There's nothing impossible with God. So if you have a need this morning, just raise your hand right now. Raise your hand right now to the Lord as we pray for this need. Amen. All over the sanctuary. And those who are watching online, God is there with you. Amen. So let's just uh, pray together. Father, we just come before you in the precious name of Jesus. That name that is above every other name. And Lord, we're reminded again in your word that when you walked the face of this earth, you looked upon the multitude of people and you had compassion, great love for them. And Lord, you, the sick were healed. The lame could walk, the blind could see, the deaf could hear, and you rose Lazarus from the dead. And Lord, there's needs right now in many that are here, and you see everyone because you're here, Lord, to meet their needs. And Lord, we're asking, Lord, that you would heal those that need a healing touch, those that need a financial touch, those that are heartbroken today. Lord, whatever the need is, you are willing and able to meet their needs. So, Lord, grant it just now. And, Lord, may we hear testimony about how, once again, you've intervened in our lives. God, because you are a God of mercy, a God of grace, and a God of love. Your word is true. So, Lord, we're going to praise you ahead of time, and we're going to thank you ahead of time for what you're doing right now in their hearts and their minds and their bodies. In Jesus' name, we give you thanks and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. we just like to, uh, anybody here for the first time today? Anybody here that's new for the first time? Just put your, yes, way in the back. Praise the Lord right here. Amen. Can we have a couple? Ushers, yeah, we want to give you a, a gift this morning. Amen. There's two who need another. Yes, praise the Lord. We give you a, a, a cup with our daily bread in it. And I think there's some uh, Swiss chocolate cocoa in there. And, and just uh, that's a blessing right there. Now, our daily bread is a blessing. And I've said this often, whether you want, like cocoa or I, I, we still got a candy cane in there, huh? All right. Praise the Lord. <laughs> All right. Well, he's happy with it. Amen. Praise Amen. God. Hallelujah. Let's give him a warm hand of welcome again. 
Good to have you with us uh, this morning. Uh, praise the Lord. Yes, welcome, newcomers. We're glad. I want to add my uh, welcome from uh, uh, as well as, as Pastor Dick. Uh, in the, uh, now, I have to tell you, I, I'm thinking that that Swiss Miss Coco is probably not really Swiss. It's probably not from Switzerland. But uh, we hope that you find our, our greeting and our friendliness genuine. Uh, if you uh, uh, look on the front of your pew, uh, you'll see a red card. If you're a newcomer, there's a CR code there. If you point your smartphone, your camera at that, uh, it'll bring you to a link where you can kind of tell us a little bit about who you are and, uh, and so we can get to know you uh, a little bit. But uh, we're, we're glad, that you, glad that you're here. Um, I want to, uh, uh, we, we missed you last week. Um, we had to cancel service because of the snow. That was a pretty good snowstorm uh, for, uh, you know, we had a, a good New England blizzard uh, last weekend. Um, the plows were out several, several times uh, during that weekend storm and even uh, uh, last. And every time they come to our uh, parking lot and I hear them coming in and that just grinding sound of the shovel coming across the, the, the pavement, all I can think is, that is costing us money. <laughs> oh, there's more money I can hear shoveling up even as, as we speak. But listen, uh, we, uh, uh, I'm, I am blessed that uh, we've got a great, we do have a great company, and we uh, pray for them. They do a great job. But that, along with other bills, uh, uh, require us to uh, uh, continue to support our church. We weren't able to take an offering uh, last week. Uh, we continue to find things in the building that uh, are in need of repair. So, But you know what? Riverside Assembly of God, you as a church body have continued to be faithful year after year after year. I'm into my 11th year now here at Riverside, and I can say without a shadow of a doubt that this is a, ca this is a congregation that understands God's plan for them and understands his plan to help support our church financially. So I'm going to ask our ushers to come, uh, come to the front, and in a moment we're going to pray and we're going to sing a song, and as we sing, you can come down and uh, uh, put your offering in the basket. Uh, if you'd rather not come down, you got a uh, problem and uh, have a hard time uh, walking down, feel free to wave your offering, somebody to come and, and get it from you. But uh, let's let this be a part of our praise as well. We worship God not just through our songs, we worship God through the things we do, and giving to him is part of that process. Heavenly Father, God, you are our God. You are in this place. You rule over, and God, you have anointed us as Riverside Assembly to be a light to the uh, uh, community around us. Help us to spread your love, your truth, your peace uh, around to, through the Merrimack Valley. God, give us a uh, uh, provision so that we can do that. We ask your blessing upon God, Lord, God, those that are giving, those that are giving sacrificially. We thank you for them, and we ask, Lord, that they would have abundant blessing in return and that they would know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you are smiling at them. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Feel free to come up and give. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sin And won the victory My Savior forever Well, he sought me And he bought me With his redeeming blood He loved me ere I knew him And all my love is to him He plunged me to victory Beneath the cleansing flood I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing. 
How he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, oh dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Sing it with me. Oh, victory in Jesus, he's my Savior forever. Oh, well, he sought me and he bought me with his redeeming, his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood oh it's victory in my jesus he's my savior forever he sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me ere i knew him and all my love is to him he plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood he plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood amen praise the lord that shouting ground right there praise god hallelujah let me leave you with some announcements this morning tuesday night prayer meetings Start at 7 p.m. You're welcome to come and walk around, and stay at the altar, and just uh, seek the face of God. Amen. We all need we all need Him, don't we? Amen. And we know that prayer moves His hands. So praise God. Uh, numbered offerings envelopes. Uh, the end of year giving reports are available in the lobby. So if you haven't picked it up yet, they're there. So um, uh, you, you know you can pick it up. So it's there for you. Riverside Youth meets on Friday nights at 6.30 p.m. every Friday night. We just gather together and have a great time and learn all about Jesus and have fun doing it. Amen. Praise the Lord. Our annual church business meeting will take place directly after the service today. All members are requested to attend. Nominees for the position of deacon are posted uh, in the church bulletin, bulletin in the back there. Amen. Pray that uh, all members, amen, will stay after the service, because we need to have a quorum, right? So we'll see what happens. Praise the Lord. Riverside Prayer Team, ready to pray uh, for you. Uh, email prayer at riversideag.com or text to 978-873-PRAY. And like we say often, there are people, uh, once we get contacted for, the, for that need, uh, people all over just begin to pray for, for that need. So you know, it's encouraging to know that, uh, you know, and let us know, you know, what's happening so that we can, uh, you know, lift you up in prayer and uh, th that God would, would meet your need. Amen? Praise the Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Pastor Dick. Uh, I do encourage you to come out for uh, our uh, annual business meeting. After, even if we don't have a quorum uh, today, we are going to at least go through the reports uh, as quickly as possible. I promise you it won't take too long. Um, so I'll give you some instructions after uh, at the end of service. But what we're going to do is we are going to have a quick dismissal. Everybody can go out. Sign, if you're an official member, go out and cross out your name on the list, and you can take one of the packets uh, and come right back in, and we'll, we'll get this over as quickly as possible uh, because I'm sure you'll be getting hungry, um, which is uh, understandable, and we don't want to keep you from your lunch any longer than, obviously, you know, Pastor Dan appreciates a good lunch. Uh, so uh, we don't want to keep you any, any longer than, than is necessary. God bless you guys. I'm glad you're here. Man, it, it's, it, I was telling Don when we first came in, it, it seems like it's been a long time. I mean, I know we only missed a week, but still, uh, it seems like a while. So it's good that you're here today and that we can come and, and worship God together and, and to uh, l listen to his word and see what he has to say to us. 
You know, a, a story is told of a man who, uh, uh, who was a lawyer. He was kind of a wicked lawyer, and he hired a horse from a man, and he needed a horse, and so he rented a horse. He hired a horse from a man in Texas. And this lawyer rode the horse so hard for days, but he neglected to really care for the horse, neglected to feed the horse, and at the end of the week that he had rented the horse for, the horse dropped dead. Well, of course, the guy that had rented the horse to him was, was pretty upset about that. He, you know, he was, uh, hey, you know, I, this, this is my property, and, and it, it's dead. And the, the lawyer said, okay, yeah, 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 no, it, it's my fault. Uh, and so the, the owner of the horse, he demanded, he said, look, I want to be repaid the value of my horse plus the money that I, I was going to make from this horse for, for years to come. And he said, I think that would come to about $500. And the lawyer agreed to the sum, and he said, yeah, I, I think that's about right, but this, this wicked lawyer, he said, uh, you know, I understand I'm liable for this, but I, I'm kind of, I'm a little short on cash right now. I'm a little strapped for cash. He said, would you take a promissory note? Now, a promissory note was, was, was like an IOU, but it was official. It was stamped by a bank at, that uh, he would pay back the $500. And he said, uh, 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 now I, it may take a little time for me, and, I, and uh, I, I'm not sure what, to write, what date to write as far as its due date for this $500. And so the owner said, well, you know, okay, just write in whatever date that you think you'll be able to pay it back. And so the lawyer wrote in that he would pay the man $500 due on judgment day. Now, of course, this outraged the, uh, uh, the owner of the horse, of the former horse, when he uh, uh, got the promissory note. And so he took the lawyer to court. And during the court hearing, the man said to the judge, he said, look, this is the worth of the horse. He died because of the liability of, of the lawyer. And the judge agreed. The judge agreed that the lawyer was at fault. And he awarded the man the full $500. Now, the lawyer jumped up and said, but wait, wait. Uh, look at this note. I don't have to pay this man until Judgment Day. And the judge said, I know. I'm the judge. Today is Judgment Day. We're studying the book of Revelation. And last time we saw God begin a new cycle of judgment on the earth. He had started with seven seals on a scroll. And now we are on seven trumpets that God has called angels to blow to signal different aspects of his judgment upon the earth. Last time we were here, we saw that, that God was in control. We saw uh, uh, four of the trumpets blow, three of the trumpets remain. We saw that... Uh, there is a benefit to waiting. And that sometimes it's in the waiting that we learn the most. Today we're going to continue to see the trumpets blow. God's judgment poured out onto the earth. But yet his grace will continue to stand. Let's pray. Father, we're, we're going to look at your word today. And we expect your spirit to speak to us. Because you've promised us that. So God, help us to have just open hearts. Help us to be willing to receive. Help us to put aside all the things outside that might seek to distract us. And instead, focus on you. Just, just for this next time, Lord, help us to put everything else aside and focus on what you have to say to us. In the name of Jesus, I pray this. Amen. Amen. So, John the Revelator. He is watching in shock and awe as Jesus reveals to him the tribulations that are to come. After specific messages to the seven churches in Asia Minor, God is revealing to all of us, including John, through John, the things that are to come. Now there is this pattern of persecution that has faced the church of Jesus Christ throughout all of church history. There's also been 
a pattern of judgment upon the wicked. But what we're looking at here is not just a description of the pattern that has existed since the, th throughout the history of the church. What we're looking at here so far in Revelation is not just a pattern of tribulation and trial. Instead, God is revealing the final chapter of the history of the world. And from the very throne room of God, Jesus, the Lamb of God, has opened the seals and the, on the scroll, releasing the message of what is to come. The first four of the seals were opened and unleashed the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And there we saw a pattern of these horsemen that was all too familiar for those of us who are reading. Conquest, war, economic devastation, and death. At the opening of the fifth seal, we heard the cry of the martyrs, those killed for the sake of Christ, calling out to God, seeking an end to the evil that mankind brings upon itself, and they call out for justice. At the opening of the sixth seal, we saw signs on the heavens and on the earth, signaling the coming of Jesus, the return of the King. And the opening of the seventh seal brought silence for half an hour. And during that time, the assembled hosts of heaven in God's throne room waited. They waited to see what God would do. And in his timing, God acted. What God did was open up another cycle of judgments, this time represented by seven trumpets. Last time we saw the first four of these trumpets blow. At the first trumpet, we saw hail, fire, and blood destroy a third of the trees and the crops on the earth. At the second trumpet, we saw a third of the oceans become toxic, killing all the sea life there. At the sound of the third trumpet, a third of the fresh water on the earth was made undrinkable. And after the fourth trumpet was blown, a third of the sky was darkened. Now in the interim between the third trumpet and the fourth trumpet, a warning was given. And we saw that last time in Revelation 8.13. It says this, Then I looked and heard an eagle crying out with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead. Woe, woe, woe to those who, who dwell on the earth at the blast of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. The eagle is saying, you think you've had it bad so far. Beware of what is to come. Three woes, the three more trumpets. It's warning them and saying, get right with God, because these last three trumpets are going to be even worse. So then we move to the fifth trumpet. At the sounding of the fifth trumpet, it unleashes a terrible plague upon the earth. Revelation chapter 9, verse 1. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet. I could try to blow the trumpet. The angels are much better at blowing trumpets than I am. Maybe I should practice. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth. And he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. Who is this star that falls from heaven? I'll be completely honest with you. I'm not completely sure. It doesn't exactly say. There are some who equate this star falling from heaven with the fall of Satan. Because similar language was used by Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 10 and verse 18. It said, and he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So I can see that as a possibility. But I lean more towards this uh, star from heaven being an actual angel. Because later in Revelation, we're going to see that uh, an angel holds the keys to the pit, the bottomless pit. And so the use of this key leads to a terrifying pestilence on the earth. And we see that in verses 2 and 3 of chapter 9. It says, He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions on the earth. There are swarms of locusts that still afflict the earth today. In fact, uh, East Africa has been 
seeing some terrible uh, swarms of locusts in recent years. They settle on the crops and they devour everything they come across. The sky is darkened as the swarms of locusts fly. And even in the time of ancient, uh, 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 ancient Turkey, uh, in, in uh, what's called the, uh, Turkey today, which have been the uh, seven churches of Asia who were first receiving that, and as it was passed around, they were familiar with locusts. They had, even if locusts weren't swarming at the time, they had heard the stories of locusts coming and consuming all the crops they were, they were growing. But these locusts are like no locust swarm that they've ever seen. Indeed, it's like no locust swarm that was ever seen on the earth. Look at verse 4. They were told, I mean the locusts were told, not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. These locusts are not going after the crops. These locusts are going after people. But not everybody. Believers in Christ, Christians, true followers of Jesus, true disciples of Jesus, they're not being harmed. Now look, some take this verse out of context and say, oh, that means trials and tribulations should not afflict Christians. Look, if they're getting that message, they've ignored the first seven chapters of Revelation. Because those first seven chapters uh, show us trials and tribulation. In fact, one of the main themes of Revelation is there will be troubles. There will be persecution. But that God is able to help us through those troubles. God is able to help us through those times of persecution. And this is more, of course, than your typical trials and tribulation. This is the final chapter. This is the end of the story. We are speeding towards the ultimate and final judgment of the wicked. So here the locusts only afflict those who have rejected Jesus. Even after the signs, the the first six seals, even after the first four trumpets, people on the earth are still rejecting Jesus. Those are the ones who the locusts are afflicting. The vision goes on to show that how strange these locusts are and what they will do. Verses 5 through 6. They were allowed to torment them, torment the people, for five months, but not to kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. In those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. Normally, locust swarms settle in an area where there are crops and vegetation, and they'll stay a few days and then they'll finish eating, and they'll move on to the next area. But for five months, these locusts plague those who have rejected Christ. And like real scorpions, you know, we, we think of scorpions, we've seen them, you know, we're up in the northeast, so we don't see scorpions. But I've got friends and family down in Arizona, New Mexico, they see scorpions all the time. And they will hurt you. They will sting you. But scorpion venom will not kill you. You're too big for it to kill. If it it gets to a a rabbit or something, which is what scorpions feed on, uh, that will kill them. But you're too big for scorpion venom to kill. But like scorpions, the locusts here, their sting, they torment these victims, but their venom does not kill. They, They torment these victims without mercy. Their victims plead for death over this torment. But this isn't a plague of death. This this poison isn't killing them. This isn't a plague of death. This is a plague of warning. This torment is saying, repent. The end is near. The final chapter has begun. Time is running out. Now, could these locusts that are being described be a symbol of something else or an allegory for something else? Absolutely it could be. But we're kind of examining things here on the surface because that's really all the understanding we have right now. Anything else is a guess. Like we've known, like we've talked over and over again, we don't fully understand prophetic 
prophecy, prophecy that uh, is pointing towards the future, future prophecy. We don't fully understand it until it all takes place. And then we look back at it and say, oh, this is exactly what they meant. So for now, we're looking at the serpents. What does it say to us here? John goes on to describe these locusts in really fantastical terms, something uh, uh, from, from a, a fantasy novel. Uh, Revelation 9, 7 through 10. In appearance, the locusts were like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces, their hair like women's hair, and their teeth like lion's teeth. They had breastplates, like breastplates of honor, I, excuse me, of iron, and the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into battle. They have tails and stings like scorpions, and their power to hurt people for five months is in their tails. Okay. This is what we've been waiting for. When we think of Revelation, this is that kind of really strange, weird things that we don't completely understand. This is what we think of when we think of the book of Revelation. And I'll be honest, that is a weird description. I don't really even understand that description. I can't picture this in my mind. And the pictures that I see online of people that have tried to draw this, they look pretty silly. Now, I will say this. It is very similar to a description of a locust swarm that was given by the prophet Joel. We used to sing a song in church, an older song. Pastor Dick, you probably remember, Blow the Trumpet in Zion. Because it was taken from this scripture in Joel where it says they rush on the city, they run on the walls. Great is the army that carries out God's word. And we sang that and we said, ah, we, are, we are the army that carries. But the prophecy was talking about a swarm of locusts. They rushed on the city. This swarm of locusts ran along the walls. This was an army that carried out the word of God. And, and this is what it says in Joel 2, 4 through 6. It says their appearance is like the appearance of horses. And like war horses, they run. As with the rumbling of chariots, they leap on the top of mountains, like the crackling of a flame of fire, devouring the stubble like a powerful army, drawn up for battle. Before them, people are in anguish. All faces grow pale. So there's a similarity here to this swarm of locusts in Revelation, in, to a swarm of locusts that was prophes prophesied hundreds of years ago by the prophet Job. So even though I have a hard time picturing this description of this swarm of, of, of locusts, I do know this. As terrible as they are, these locusts are an army of God because they are carrying out His Word. Remember, our focus, the, the foundation of the book of Revelation, everything that's coming goes back to chapters 4 and 5 in the throne room of God. God the Almighty, enthroned upon high, worshipped the angelic beings, worshipped by, by the, the saints and the elders. Everything that we're seeing is coming from the throne of God. And as if to emphasize this, John learns who the angel is that has let the locusts out of the pit. And that's seen in verse 11. They have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he is called Apollyon. Now these words, both the Hebrew and the Greek word, translate to the English word destruction, or destroyer, probably in this case. Now as I said before, there are some people that think this angel is the fallen angel, Satan. Um, I don't really think that is. I mean, I know that it could be. Uh, I'm not going to be dogmatic about this, but I, don't, I think that this army of locusts is operating under the Lord's command. I know that this army of locusts is operating under the Lord's command. He is a God of love, but he is also a God of judgment. The angel named destruction or destroyer is following the command of God. That's something that the fallen angel, that's something that our enemy Satan doesn't do. In fact, when the people of Israel way back in Exodus, were in bondage, enslaved in 
Israel or in Egypt. They were enslaved in Egypt and God was going to release them from Egypt and so he sent plagues. And the final plague was going to be the death of the firstborn children. And in that plague of death of the firstborn, Moses says this to the people, Exodus 12, 23, For the Lord will pass through and to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer, and that Hebrew word there is Abaddon, to enter your houses to strike you. It's very possible that this angel who opens the pit that allows the locust swarm to escape and to uh, be a pestilence upon the people of the earth, it's possible that that angel is the same as the one who brought death to the firstborn son of the Egyptians. We don't like to think about these things. These are hard things. These aren't the happiest portions of the Scripture. But I want you to take courage that we are among the rescued. We are among the ones who are saved. We are the, uh, uh, the ones taken upon the ark. We are the ones with the blood on the door. We are the one who death passes over because we are followers of Christ. And he has put his mark of ownership upon us. The blood of Jesus is painted upon the doors of our hearts so that the the destroying angel has no power over us. We will not taste the second death. And our portion for today finishes with verse 12. The first woe has passed. Behold, two woes are still to come, two trumpets still to be blown. What lessons can we take from what we've heard today? What lessons can we take home and say, how does this strange stuff of this fifth trumpet, how can I apply that to my life? Listen, the Holy Spirit will apply things to your heart because the Holy Spirit knows exactly where you are in Him. The Holy Spirit knows if if, if you're close to God or if you're wandering from God. And so the Lord, the Lord will speak through his spirit to your heart exactly where you are. And maybe already as we read this portion of scripture, the Holy Spirit has spoken to you. And let me just share with you what the Holy, how the Holy Spirit spoke to me as I studied this passage of scripture. Here's the first lesson I'm taking home. God is with us in times of trouble. God is with us in times of trouble. That fifth, fifth trumpet blast brings terrible, terrible tribulation, a plague of locusts that bring agony in their wake. But there is a population that is spared. It is those who have the seal of God on them. As we saw before, this seal, this seal is a seal of ownership. Saying, this one belongs to me. This one is mine. And it's this ownership that provides us protection. Believers have certainly suffered during this final chapter of human history. We've already seen believers suffering already. In fact, the fifth seal, if you remember, shows that Christians not only suffered, Christians were even being killed for the cause of Christ. But this protection uh, protection during the plague of locusts, it's a reminder to us. Here in this final chapter... We see this pattern once again, and that's that God's hand is on us during times of trouble. What we are studying is the final chapter of judgment. But this pattern of troubles in a broken world, it's still on us. It's on us even now. It's always been on us. We face trials and tribulations and temptation. We face that daily. But the hand of God is still upon us. The seal of his ownership rests on our heads. Now, this doesn't mean we're going to be spared trouble. In fact, if somebody tells you, hey, you should join this religion because you won't have any troubles anymore, they are selling you a bill of goods. And that's not Christianity. In fact, Scripture guarantees we're going to have trouble. But what we're called to, what we see in Revelation, we're called to persevere 
in times of trouble. But it is God's presence, it is God's hand on our lives that allows us to persevere through times of trouble. Don't try to persevere in your own strength. Rather, trust God's power on your life. His hand is on you. It's, he's promised this. So put your faith in him, and he will see you through times of trouble. Here's the second lesson I'm taking away. God's grace resides in his judgment. His grace resides in his judgment. This plague of locusts from the fifth trumpet, it's horrible. We don't like to read it. They swarm and infest a mankind for five months. They cause pain, they cause torment. And yet it's not deadly. The poison of these locusts that that injects into their victim does not end life. It only makes life seem unbearable. Why would God do that? Because even in judgment, God is calling men and women to repentance. He is letting them know, look, the final judgment is on its way. This is just a taste of what is to come. The gift of salvation is available to you. Take hold of Jesus, of what he offers, before it's too late. In this life, all of us, all people of all, all around the world, they are afflicted and experience the pestilence of sin. Men and women and children all over the earth suffer. And as a result of that, and you probably heard this question, this question has been asked and echoed throughout the millennia. Why would God do this? Why would God allow such suffering to take place? Suffering that sometimes makes life seem unbearable. I'm not going to pretend that there are easy answers to this. But here's what I know. Part of the reason God allows this is because he is continuing to call people to repentance. Deserved or not, he allows, God allows suffering to let people know there is a final judgment on its way. This is just a taste of the judgment of what is to come. The gift of salvation stands before you. Won't you take hold of what Jesus has to offer you while there is still time? All around you, there are people in your life who are asking the same question. Why is God letting this happen to me? Why is this happening to me? Why is God allowing me to go through this? Do you have an answer for them? Can you let them know that Jesus is the answer? Do you give them the message of love and repentance before it's too late? Here's a third and final lesson that I'm taking away from this passage of Scripture. Our God is a God of judgment. And we are seeing in this final chapter of the earth a depiction of who God truly is. This is God's Word. God's Word shows us who God is, and Revelation is part of God's Word. God's love and God's grace are absolutely part of the scene that we see playing out before us in Revelation 9. But His judgment is there too, and that judgment is a part of His nature. We can't separate the aspects of God and choose only to worship the ones that we feel comfortable with. I only, oh my God, I like the peace-loving God. The sacrificial God I like. The, 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 the nice God. The God who heals. Oh, that's a good one. He's all those things, but he is also a God of judgment. You wouldn't want your spouse to say to you, or, or, or your, your, your friend, or to say... Uh, no, I like all this. All, I, I love a lot of things about you, but here's a list of the things I don't like, and I'm just going to ignore those. Listen, every part of us, we want someone to love the whole of us. And God is perfect. Every part of him is perfect, even his judgment. We can't separate the parts of God we like and only worship the parts of him that make us feel comfortable. Because he is a God of judgment. 
And this judgment, it's the result of who he is. It's the result of his nature. Because God is holy and God is just. That means sin will not go unpunished. Isaiah 5.16 says, But the Lord of hosts is exalted in justice, and the holy God shows himself holy in righteousness. It is who he is. He is holy. He is righteous. And if injustice or unrighteousness was allowed to flourish forever, that would be unjust. And God cannot be unjust. God cannot be unrighteousness. If sin was allowed to go without punishment, that would be unjust. And God cannot be unjust. So in His holy, in His holiness, God's judgment is righteous. You know, we all claim to love justice until we're on the receiving end of justice. You know, when I was a, a big brother... And I saw my sister get spanked. It's like, this is justice. Yes. Finally, she, finally my mom sees. I love my sister. But when I got the spanking, oh, this is too much. We all claim to love justice until we're, the, we're on the receiving end of it. And all who have sinned deserve punishment. And all of us have sinned. That's what's right. That is what just is just. Sin deserves punishment. Now here's the good news. The father's punishment for sin was poured out on his son. His punishment of my sin was poured out on Jesus. Jesus took the punishment that I deserved. Jesus took the punishment that we all deserved. That doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem fair to Jesus. But it is just. His punishment has been meted out. Sin was punished. Justice was done. And now, all who receive him and have that forgiveness of their sins because the price has already been paid. All who receive him can receive forgiveness and become children of God. We are able to stand justly before God as holy and as his child because Jesus took the punishment for our sins. It is only those who continue to stand in rebellion to God who need to fear the judgment from God. Freedom from judgment and the gift of eternal life are available to you today. All because of what Jesus did on the cross. We're going to take some time now to remember that as we get ready for our communion service. I'm going to ask the ushers and those who are helping with serving communion to be ready. I want you to know that here at Riverside, we, we serve what we call an open communion. Some churches serve closed communion, and that's up to them, but we serve an open communion. That means you don't have to be part of our church. You can be a visitor. You can be, uh, have been here just a few times. You're not an official member yet. Listen, all you need to be is a follower of Jesus Christ, a disciple of Jesus. You need to have received the gift that we're remembering through this communion service. You need to have accepted Christ as your Savior, given your life over to Him. And if you've done that, then by all means, we're part of the family of God together, no matter what your church home is. We're part of God's family, and we can celebrate this communion together. In fact, we're really celebrating with churches all around our area, all around our country, all around the world who are celebrating communion. So, If you're a Christian, by all means, take communion with us. If you haven't given your life over to Jesus yet, today's the day you can do that. Today's the day you can say, God, forgive me of what I've done and who I've been. Make me your child. 
I give my life to you. If you'll say that in your heart and mean it, the Bible has promised that Jesus will forgive your sins because of his sacrifice on the cross. And if you do that, even now as we take some time and pray, then you can certainly take communion with us. I'm going to ask the ushers to go ahead and come forward. We ask that you would hold on to the element of, of communion. There, we've still got the, um, the uh, uh, portable communions that have, uh, there's a, a wrapper that you take off the top in order to get to the bread, a wrapper that you, then afterwards you'll take uh, the foil off the uh, cup in order to access the juice. But we ask that you'd hold on to that cup before, uh, uh, so that everybody is served, so that we can, in unity, take communion together. And as we, I'm going to sing here, and you can sing along, but I encourage you to search your heart, see what God is, is saying to you today, what things you might want to get right in your heart. Listen to what he has to say and think about what Jesus did for you on the cross. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where Thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to Thy precious bleed. I am thine, O oh Lord, I have heard thy voice, and you told thy love to me, but I long to rise in the arms of faith, and be closer drawn to Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where Thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to Thy precious bleed. Consecrate me now in thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thine. Oh, draw me nearer, draw me nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where Thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to Thy precious bleeding side. Oh, the pure delight of a single hour that before thy throne I spend. When I kneel in prayer and with thee, my God, I commune as friend with friend. Oh, and draw me near. Thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy presence.
hasn't been served communion we want to make sure everybody has a chance to partake of it. Amen. Pastor Dick, would you read the first scripture verse, please? For I have received from the Lord what I also deliver to you. That the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Heavenly Pastor Father, Jesus, would you pray? We thank you for the broken body of Jesus. Broken for us. Suffering real pain. Real torture. God, you to chose to allow your son to face this for our sins because of your love for us. Today we remember the broken body of Jesus and we thank you for it. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's partake of the bread together. Thank you, Jesus. Body of our Lord, body of Christ. Pastor Dick, please read the... In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, we proclaim the death of your son, Jesus that God himself became man in order to die upon a cross so that our sins could be forgiven. The blood which was shed, God, which we represent by this cup, was shed for me, was shed for all. And God, by partaking to this cup this morning, Help us to remember what this cost you. We show the Lord's death until you come again. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's partake of the cup together. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. Draw me nearer. Sing it with me. Never blessed Lord to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, nearer, never blessed Lord to thy precious bleeding side. Let me just give you a few instructions. As we get ready for the end of our uh, service and the beginning of our, our business meeting, I'm going to ask the ushers to make sure that the uh, sign-up sheet and the, uh, uh, the packets for the, um, uh, for the business meeting are ready to go. Uh, that um, uh, Don't hand out the ballots at this time. We're going to hold on to those for now. Uh, if you are an official member of the church, we ask that uh, as you leave today, you would go to the table, try to keep some distance between you and the next person. When you see your name on the list, strike out your name. Hopefully they're in alphabetical order, so that'll be easy. And then take one of the packets, one of the folders, and then come back inside and have a seat, and we'll get started as soon as we can. Um, please, uh, if you are a member of the church, um, please stay for that business meeting. And hey, I just want to again mention, uh, those of you that are guests with us today, man, I'm sorry that I don't get to come out. I'd usually come out back and make sure I got to greet you, but thank you so much for coming. We hope you felt the presence of God today. Uh, if we didn't have the business meeting and need to get set up, I'd, I'd come and say hi. And, but uh, hopefully fill out that thing by pointing your camera at the uh, 
uh, at, the, uh, at the red card there on your pew, and we hope that you've uh, had a good time with us here at uh, Riverside Assembly today. Pastor Dick, would you come and dismiss us in prayer? <laughs> Father, we want to thank you once again for your great love, your grace, and your mercy. Lord, help us to, Lord, every day, every day to remember you, to remember what you, yes, God. who you are and what you do. Lord, not just on Sunday morning, but Lord, every day, Lord, what you have done for us that we could not do for ourselves, that we could be reconciled back to the Father because of your great love and your sacrifice. So, Lord, again, we just want to give you praise and glory. And all God's children said, amen. Praise the Lord. Please get your packets in the back if you are members. Amen. God bless you.